Ephesians 6, chapter 6, that is, verses 10 through uh, 20, is the text that we've been in for the last couple weeks. And we're taking it slow because there is so much here that we need to comprehend, so much here that we need to understand and receive and apply in our lives. Paul says in verse 10, finally, my brethren, and and that finally, my brethren, is an indication that he's coming to the close of this letter. He's, He's made the points that he wants to make. He's talked to us about all that God has done for us, all that God has given to us and much of what God expects from us. And now he he gives us this encouragement, this exhortation. This is the speech that the coach gives in the locker room on a Friday night before the players go out and take the field. It's that last thing he needs to tell us. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There are some very important principles that are placed before us from this passage. We are exhorted to be strong. Now, Paul would not tell us to be strong unless the capacity for strength was present. Now, I know so very often we feel weak. We feel overwhelmed by the cares of this world, by the circumstances that surround us, by all of the trials and the tragedies and the tribulations that come our way. We can feel very overwhelmed, and this world is an overwhelming place. But we're called to be strong. We are called to exercise strength. I'm reminded of Latimer and Ridley, those two Protestant men who during the Reformation had been thrown in prison for their testimony and were about to be burned at the stake. And as they're being taken out of the prison and led to the stake, one says to the other, play the man and we will light this day such a flame in England that et cetera, et cetera, right? There's this, there's this exhortation to, to, hey, play the man. Even if you don't feel the part, play the man. In other words, rise to the occasion. You know, when we are under pressure, when we are under attack, that is when what is truly inside comes out. You don't know what kind of cup of tea you are until you find yourself in hot water, it's been said. Finally, my brethren, be strong. But here's the thing, not in your own strength, but rather be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You see, the strength that we exercise is not our own. Now, the Bible does tell us that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, but then the very next passage says, for it is God who has worked in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. You see, the strength that we express is not our strength, it is his strength being manifested in our lives. You like power tools? I like power tools. I'm not particularly good at using power tools, but I like the idea of power tools. If you've ever tried to to cut something with a handsaw and then be relieved from that responsibility by someone who has a power saw, it's an amazing sight to see. When we were in Peru and we were cutting uh, beams to go up on that ceiling, Philip was out there with that, you know, that, that cordless power saw, and it was like, just done, you know? And I was thinking at the time, man, what would this be like if we had to do all of this by hand? Man. But you see, at one point, we ran into a problem. And the problem was the battery started to die. So what did we have to do? 
you can't take that saw, that circular power saw, whatever that thing is, and, and just use it by hand, can you? You're not going to get very far if you do. You need a fresh battery to be put in there because you need to be connected to a power source that comes from outside of yourself. And so many of us are like people trying to use a power saw without any power plugged into it. We have something that looks good on the outside, but there's no energy in it. In order to be empowered, we've got to be connected, right? We've got to be connected to the Lord because it is his strength that is demonstrated through us when we are connected to him. So Paul is writing here, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, the whole armor. So so often we look at this verse and we want to put the emphasis on the of God part. Put on the whole armor of God. Yes, we know it is God's armor. Look at the things that that armor is made up of. It's made up of uh, the, the, the helmet of salvation. Does that come from us? No, God is the one who saves us. The breastplate of righteousness, is that our righteousness? No, it is an imputed righteousness that God has given unto us through Jesus Christ, his son, and his shed blood on the cross. Uh, Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Is it our peace or is it the peace of God that passes all understanding? Is it our gospel? No, it's his gospel. The belt of truth. Man, I'll tell you what, we are very loosely acquainted with the truth as human beings. Sometimes we don't even see the truth when it smacks us in the head with a two by four. He is the truth. Jesus didn't just say, I tell the truth. He said, I am the truth. So that that belt of truth, that's not ours. That belongs to him. The shield of faith that we take up, right? The shield of faith. What does Ephesians 2 teach us? In chapter 2, verse 8, Ephesians says that you are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. But it's the gift of God, right? Right? So that shield, that's not our shield, that's his shield. And the sword, that sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. Even in the name, it's very clear, that's not our sword, that's his sword. So yes, absolutely, we are to put on the whole armor of God. It is God's armor, we can't forge it for ourselves, We can't go out and buy it for ourselves. It is given to us by God. But the emphasis in this passage really is on that word, the whole armor of God. We are to put on the whole armor of God. In other words, not just salvation and then no faith. Not just faith, but no peace. Not just peace, but no righteousness. Not just righteousness, but no truth. Not just truth, but no sword. No, we need the whole armor of God. We need all of it. Listen, we need everything that God has for us in order to be strong in his strength. In order to be strong in the power of his might. We need all that he has for us. And so Paul exhorts them again, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against what? Against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Listen, friends, we have got to recognize the enemy when we see him at work. So often, we look at the external elements that we face and the challenges that we face, and we think that that's the enemy. But let me give you a hint here. Your boss is not the enemy. The government is not the enemy. Even foreign governments, threats foreign and domestic, that's not the real enemy. Let me bring it a little closer to home. Your kids are not the enemy. 
Your parents are not the enemy. Your spouse is not the enemy. But there is an enemy. There is an enemy, and this enemy wants to undermine God's authority in your life. He wants to undermine your confidence in the word of God. He wants to cause you to question, to doubt, to self-recriminate, to to lose confidence in the fact that God has called you to be strong in the power of his mind. He wants to take away your peace. He wants to steal your joy. So it is important for us to recognize our enemy when we see him. Now last week we talked about not giving the devil a foothold not giving him a place to stand and a stick to hit you with. And we talked about ways in which we give the enemy opportunity in our lives. But today I want us to take a closer look at his methods. Because you see that word, the wiles of the devil, that word is where we get our word methods from, if you look it up in the Greek. It it gives us that word methods today. So what are his methods? What are his schemes? What are the traps that he sets for us? And what is it about us that makes us susceptible to his tricks? Well, I was never a very good football player. I was third string at best, special teams on occasion. But I did learn a lot from my time as a high school football player. And one of the things that I recognize is the importance of game footage. How many of you can recognize that yourself? The importance of game footage. When you watch the game after the fact, you can see where the mistakes were made. And coaches and scouts take that to the next level. They look not only at your game film, but they also look at the game film of whom? Your opponents, right? They want to see what that team you're up against next week, what they're like. Well, we need to know what our enemy is like too. So today I want us to watch some game film on the enemy, to look at some things that he's done and some plays that he's called over the millennia so that we can be better prepared to recognize what he's trying to do in our own lives as well. Now, I do want to say as we begin that it is important to know him and to know who he is, but I don't want us to become preoccupied with him. As I talked about last week, there are two extremes to which we can go, both of which are wrong. One of which is to not believe that he exists and to completely ignore him. And the other is to have an excessive fascination with him or with the things of darkness. And we don't want to fall on either side of that spectrum today, but it is important that we know what he is up to. As I was preparing this study, I thought that I would take a look at some of the names that he is referred to by because understanding the names by which someone is identified can help you sometimes understand the nature and the character of the individual that you're dealing with, particularly in the Bible. Names are important. Names matter. Names have meaning. I I once looked up my name, you know, Kenneth, in those little baby name books, and it means tall, dark, and handsome. So clearly... Names have meaning. They have purpose. I'm just going to let that stew for a while. All right. So what are some of the names that the enemy has been referred to as? And what do those names tell us about his character? What, what are some things that he's been called in Scripture? Well, Abaddon the accuser of the brethren. So that tells us something right there, doesn't it? He is an accuser who is constantly looking for ways in which to blame us for the things that we've done wrong. Now, here's the thing. Have you ever been falsely accused of something? Yeah? I think we all have at one time or another. But have you ever been accused of something and it turned out that it wasn't a false accusation at all? Yeah, that too. So, not everything is a false accusation. Sometimes accusations are true accusations, but nevertheless, Satan 
delights in both, doesn't he? Because he is the accuser of the brethren. He is our adversary. He is the angel of the bottomless pit known as Apollyon. He's been referred to as Beelzebub, which means the Lord of the Flies. Now, why would someone be referred to as the Lord of the flies? What do flies gather around? Refuse. They gather around refuse and decay. Well, he's, he is thrilled with refuse and decay, isn't he? He's been referred to as Belial or the devil. He is the enemy, the evil spirit, the father of lies. The father of lies, not just a liar, but the father of lies, the originator of the idea of lying. He lied from the very beginning, and we're going to look at how he lied. In fact, I think we looked at it a little bit last week, didn't we? If we look at Genesis chapters 2 and 3, what do we see? We see the Lord God did this, the Lord God did that, the Lord God did this other thing, and the words Lord and God are two different names for God, Lord being Yahweh, and God being Elohim. So all through that chapter, we see Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Elohim. In other words, the Lord God, our master, our owner, our creator. But when Satan comes into the garden and begins to speak to Eve through the serpent, he asks the first question of the Bible. Everything before was statements, but he asks the first question. If you read just the punctuation marks through those first three chapters, you'll not find a single question mark until you get to the beginning of chapter three when Satan converses with Eve and he says to her, did God really say? Hmm? First of all, he's questioning God's word. He's questioning God's authority and God's goodness and he is questioning God's sovereignty because he does not say Yahweh Elohim. He simply says Elohim. In other words, he left off the word Lord. So he lied, not through a direct statement, but rather through an implication. He is the father of lies. The great red dragon of Revelations 12.5, a lying spirit and a murderer, the old serpent, the power of darkness, the prince of this world, the prince of devils, and the prince of the power of darkness of the air. He is called the ruler of the darkness of this world, Satan, the serpent, the spirit that worketh in the sons of disobedience, the tempter, the God of this world, and ultimately the wicked one. Those are some of his names. And they are quite descriptive, aren't they? They are extremely descriptive. And yet when he appears, he doesn't always appear in this way. He he transforms himself into an angel of light, puts on his best face and his Sunday clothes and comes to us offering the world in exchange for just a little thing, just a small compromise. You see, he knows us. He he knows what makes us tick. He knows the baits that best ensnares us, and he is happy to use it. He is happy to offer it. Turn with me to to James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, verse 12, we read, Blessed is the man who endures temptation... For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted, is tempted, is tempted. That means if something is done to you, then there is an outside force working upon you, isn't there? So everyone is tempted when what happens? When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brethren. 
every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So we are tempted <clears throat> when we are drawn away by our own desires. You see, there are some people out there who can make really, really good, really, really good cake, right? We know a few of them. But what if instead of making a nice chocolate cake or instead of making a nice carrot cake, they decided that they were going to experiment a little bit and they made a Brussels sprout cake. A cake that tastes just like boiled Brussels sprouts. And they said, hey, I've got this great Brussels sprout cake that I want you to try. I'm on a diet. No, no, really, try this Brussels sprout cake. No, you know, I really, I'm watching what I eat. Thanks, no problem. Well, I've got this chocolate cake left. Sure, let me have some of that, right? Okay, what's the difference? The Brussels sprout cake. The Brussels sprout cake doesn't tempt me because there's nothing in me that desires that Brussels sprout cake. So in order for the devil to tempt us, he identifies what it is that we want, what it is that we desire. And when we desire things that we have no right to, temptation comes in. Desire is in our hearts, and it conceives, and it brings forth sin, which leads to death. So the devil's schemes, his, his methods, his, his, his manipulations are such that he studies you. He figures out what it is that you want, and then he throws that temptation towards you. If you don't believe me, just look at what he did to Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Now, there are many, many other passages that we could look at to find the, the methods of Satan. There are lots of other game footage reels that we could throw up on the screen. We could talk about what, what he did to Adam and Eve again, like we talked about last week, or we could talk about how he, uh, how he treated Job. I mean, let's just refer to that briefly. What did he do to Job? He stole Job's goods. He killed Job's children. And he destroyed Job's health and reputation. So what is it the enemy comes to do? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he does. How did he begin? By accusing Job before God. He says, oh man, you, you, you think all that of Job, you just let me at him. You let me at him and you see how he curses you to your face, right? He accuses Job before Job is even tested or tried. He brings accusations against him. And he steals and he kills and he destroys. That's what he does. But let's look not only at what he does, but at how he does it. Genesis, not Genesis, excuse me. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now, is there anything sinful about hunger? Anyone? No. It is 
a biological necessity that you have food. Hunger is natural. God gave you hunger so that you would remember to eat. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. What did Satan do? He identified a desire that Jesus had. Now, Jesus, being the sinless son of God, didn't have an evil desire in him. But he did have a natural desire in him, a desire for food. And Satan, seeing this natural desire, this desire which in and of itself is no sin, finds a way to twist it to his own purposes. He connects it with the idea of questioning the Lord. What had just happened in the life of Jesus? He had gone down to the River Jordan. He had met with John the Baptist. He had been baptized, and as he came up out of the water, the Spirit descended like a dove, and the voice was heard from heaven, "'This is my beloved Son.'" in whom I am well pleased. So God had just told Jesus, you're my kid, you're my son. That testimony had just been given to John the Baptist. This is the one, the Messiah, the son of God. And so what's the first thing that Satan does? He questions the credibility of God. If you're really the son of God, well, prove it. Put it to the test. Tell those rocks there to become bread. I mean, you've got the power. If you're really the son of God, go ahead. Satisfy your own natural desire through a manifestation of your power that is purely self-centered. And in so doing, question what God has told you. Hmm. He is appealing to a desire for food. What part of your body wants food? Is it your spirit? It's your flesh. Your flesh is the part that wants food. He is appealing to the lust of the flesh. He is saying, there's this thing you want that you desire, that you have even a craving for. Satisfy the craving through the abuse of your power. Go ahead, do it. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, I don't need to prove that what my father said was true. I will live by the fact that what my father said is true. I don't need to turn these stones into bread to show that I am the Son of God. I know that I am the Son of God because God said that I am the Son. Of God. So then the devil took him into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, what is he trying to do again? He is casting doubt and disparagement upon what God has said. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he's like, Oh, I can quote scripture too. Did you know the devil knows the Bible better than any one of us here? He can quote it chapter and verse. He knows it. And he uses it to his advantage. He twists it, takes it out of context, misapplies it, and undermines God's people with it. How many evils have been committed in this world and scripture given as their justification? Far too many. And when that happens, what we see is an example of someone who has twisted God's word for their own purposes. Satan does the very same thing. He says, it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your feet against a stone. It's like, hey, that's in the Bible too. So, hey, we're up here on top of the temple. Why don't you just jump off and let's watch those angels catch you, huh? He is appealing now not to the lust of the flesh, 
but to the pride of life. He is appealing to the pride that Jesus must feel at being the Son of God. Can you imagine what that would be like? to have angels catch you and to lower you slowly. It's amazing. It would be spectacular to see, probably spectacular to experience. But Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, it is a sin to put God to the test in a way that is presumptuous. I'll give you an example of this. At the end of Mark, Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to be with them, you know, and that they're going to do mighty works. And he says, you know, you'll take up serpents and, 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 and not die. In other words, hey, even if you get bitten by a snake, you're not going to die. Well, we see a fulfillment of that very promise in the book of Acts there on the island of Miletus as Paul is there and, and he's throwing some wood on the fire and what happens? An asp leaps out of the wood and affixes itself to his hand and he shakes it off and the natives are thinking, man, this guy must really be cursed because he survived the shipwreck only to be bitten by a poisonous serpent and they're watching him, waiting for him to die. And all of a sudden when he didn't die, they decide, whoa, he must be a god, Right? You know, because he, he survived even the snake bite. So, so there were instances where those things that Jesus had said were fulfilled. But what do we have uh, today? We have these crazy groups of people who think that handling poisonous snakes is a, an ex- example of their faith. And so you have these snake handlers. And you know what happens as often as not? They get bit. People have died from such stupidity. Well, what are they doing? They are putting God to the test. They're being presumptuous with his word. They are tempting the Lord their God. So again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. He is appealing to the lust of the eyes. He's saying to Jesus, look at all of these things. Look at the glories of the world. Look at all of these people, all of these wonderful places, all of this beauty, all of this grandeur. I will, I'll give it all to you. And what he's tempting Jesus to do through this temptation is to circumvent the cross, to get the blessings without having to go through the beatings to receive the kingdom and to reclaim the world without having to suffer upon the cross for our sins. Now, Jesus doesn't say that's a false offer. Jesus doesn't say, you don't have the authority to do that. Why? Because at this time, Satan was in charge of this world in the sense that he had usurped from Adam, our first forefather, the stewardship of the earth. Because when Adam fell, that left Satan in charge. He is the prince of this world, the prince of the power of the air, exercising dominion in this place. The offer he made to Jesus was actually legitimately an offer that he could make. But Jesus isn't tempted. He isn't isn't deceived. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So what does Satan do? What are his strategies? What are his schemes? He first identifies what it is that you want. Then he begins to cause you to question the validity and the trustworthiness of God's word. He twists the scriptures for his own purposes. He deceives you. He wants to destroy you and to kill any fruitfulness that you might have in your life. And he does so by tempting you with the very things that your heart already desires, some desires of which are legitimate, but he tempts you to secure them in illegitimate ways, right? 
I'm going to give you an example. Let's, let's talk about sex for a moment, right? Human beings have a desire for sexual intimacy. They do. And that is a God-given desire. He placed that in our hearts for the propagation of our species. He said, be fruitful and multiply. And in order to encourage us to do so, he went ahead and made it fun in the process. It's okay to say that. It's a truth, right? And so we have this natural desire, but what does Satan do with that natural desire? He says, you know, you can fulfill that desire in a variety of ways. I realize that God said that it is for the sanctity of marriage. I realize that God said that that is something that is to be just between a husband and a wife. Sure, sure, sure. He said, don't commit adultery, don't fornicate. But guess what? It's okay. You're not going to hurt anyone. You're consenting adults. Have fun. Go for it. God won't mind. But you see, sin has consequences, doesn't it? He takes, Satan takes, what is a natural desire and he pulls it out of its context and tries to persuade us to fulfill it in a way that is not honoring God or his word and ultimately is destructive for us. That's what he does. And he doesn't just do it with that, but he does it with all kinds of things. But his methods almost always fall into those three categories. We are tempted when we are led away by our own lusts. What is it that leads us away by our own lusts? It is the lust of the flesh, what we physically desire. The lust of the eyes, what we see and decide that we want. Or the pride of life, that arrogance and that pride that in us most reflects the attitude of Satan himself. Because his greatest sin, his first sin, was the sin of pride. Before he ever lied, he was filled with pride. Before he ever murdered, he was filled with self-magnification. His pride came before his fall. And the Bible tells us that that's what happens to us too, right? Pride cometh before a fall. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are are the things that Satan uses to hook into our desires, natural or unnatural, to draw us in to sin. These are his methods. In Genesis 3.1, we see that he was subtle. Tells us that the serpent was more subtle than any of God's other creatures. In Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 21 1, we read that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David. So, what does he do? He provoked David to number Israel. And that was against God's law. That was pride. David wanted to see, well, just how many men do we have in our armies? And so Satan tempted him with pride. And so he provokes. He's subtle. He provokes. He steals. He kills. He destroys. We saw that in Job. But I want you to see something else that he does, and we're going to look in Zechariah for this. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3, it's in the Minor Prophets. In Zechariah chapter 3, Zechariah is having a vision. And in verse 1 he says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. You see, Satan not only desires to steal, kill, and destroy. He not only desires to tempt us through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, but he also comes against the work that we try to do for the Lord and he opposes us. He resists the work that we're doing. But in verse two, we see that the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? 
Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. The implication there is that Satan is opposing Zechariah, and he's saying, This guy's not worthy to stand before you as high priest. Look at how he's dressed. He's wicked. He's unrighteous. He's filled with iniquity. You see, he's questioning the power of God to redeem, the power of God to purify, the grace of God to forgive, and he is opposing the work that Zechariah has to do. You know, one of the first things Satan will try to do in opposing the work that you are attempting to do for the Lord is he will tell you how unqualified you are. I had a friend who was um, working uh, as a volunteer in a prison ministry and he was asked to lead a Bible study for a group of inmates. And the man who was asking him was the, the man who was in charge of that particular ministry at Calvary Chapel Fort Worth when I attended there. And um, my friend said to the guy in charge, his name was Mike, he said, Mike, um, I, I know you've asked me to teach this Bible study, but man, I'm no theologian. I, I really don't feel like I'm qualified to teach. And Mike looked at him and he says, I'll tell you what, Chris, he says, um, you'll do until the theologians volunteer. <laughs> you see, God takes our willingness and he enables us to do what he's called us to do. Amen. And so Satan is accusing Zechariah here and, and the Lord says, yeah, no, we're not having any of that. The Lord rebuke you. And then he gives, he gives Joshua the clothes that he needs, the, righteous, the righteousness that he needs. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who are still before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. Who's that talking about? Jesus. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. <laughs> what day was that? It was that day upon the cross as the Son of God was crucified for us. The iniquity of us all was removed in that one day. Leaving Satan with no accusation to make. He is the accuser of the brethren, but the brethren have been forgiven by the blood of the Son that was shed for us. Amen? In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor. Okay, so you now have your instructions for next week. Go invite your neighbor, right? I, I know that's taken that out of context, but I couldn't resist. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. In other words, there will be joy, there will be brotherly unity, there will be celebration. Why? Because we recognize that we have all been forgiven. That all of our iniquity has been washed away. That the accusations of our enemy will fall aside when we take up the shield of faith. Satan has a desire to bind people. He has a desire to sift us, even as he did Peter. He is a liar and a murderer. Jesus calls him that himself in John chapter 8. But there's something else I want you to notice. Another piece of game footage that we need to roll real quickly here, because there's a particular move that Satan has 
that we need to be prepared to respond to in an appropriate way. Turn with me to John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, starting in verse 1, Jesus is getting very close to the cross. The time has come. Now remember, Judas has already decided that he's not happy with the way things are going. You remember when Mary broke that alabaster flask and anointed Jesus' feet with that fragrant incense and and washed his feet with her hair. Judas's attitude was, man, that could have been sold and the money could have been given to the poor. But really, he wanted to be able to skim some off the top for himself, right? Now, in chapter 13, verse 1 of John, we read these words. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose up from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, Normally, that's what I would focus on. But what I want to focus on at this moment is this. Who put that idea into Judas's heart in the first place? Satan did. Satan put that idea in Judas's heart. Now, if this was the only place in Scripture that we saw this, it wouldn't worry so much. But I want you to turn now to the book of Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 1, of course, we know that the fledgling church has been birthed in Jerusalem, that thousands were saved on the day of Pentecost, that they're meeting from house to house, that they're continuing in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and in fellowship, and that great power is being manifested and that the people are selling their goods and, and having all things in common, meeting each other's needs as the needs arise. And in verse 1 of chapter 5, we read that a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession... And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own, and and after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard those things. And the story goes on, and there are other things we could teach from this story. But again, where did the idea come from? Satan. Satan had filled Ananias' heart with the intent to lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, in each of these cases, there was something these men already desired. They desired money. They wanted to keep for themselves that which did not belong necessarily to them. In the case of Judas, it didn't. In the case of Ananias, it did. But it wasn't the money that Ananias was after. He wanted to keep the money, but he also wanted what giving the money would bring, the admiration of his fellow believers. So Judas was trying to steal cash, and Ananias was trying to steal credit. But in either case, the idea may have grown out of an evil desire they had, but the one who placed the idea in their hearts in the first place was whom? Satan. Turn with me to Acts chapter 13.
In Acts chapter 13, we see that there was at Antioch a certain There were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived In Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John, that is John Mark, as their assistant. Now, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bargesus, who was in the proconsul Sergius Paul, who was with the proconsul, rather, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Have you ever encountered people like that? It wasn't enough that they didn't believe themselves, but they didn't want anybody else to believe either. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, and he said, O full Of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of of the Lord. Who do you think put it into the proconsul's heart? Rather, not the proconsul, into the proconsul's advisor's heart. Who put it in his heart to withstand the preaching of the gospel? It was Satan himself. Friends, listen, I want you to understand that not every thought you have comes from you. Not every thought you have comes from you. Sometimes, It is Satan who puts that thought in your mind. It is not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted. The sin comes in how we respond to the temptation. When the enemy comes against us in his subtle ways, keying in on some natural desire that he then supports the fulfillment of by giving you some justification through the twisting of God's word and says, oh, it'll be all right. You know, when that thought comes into your mind, what are you to do? Well, the Bible tells us that we are to take every thought captive to the lordship of Jesus Christ. We are to take every thought captive to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Think about that. If you are on the battlefield and you are confronted by the enemy, if you are unarmed, Are you going to be able to take him captive? No, you're not. In order to take an enemy combatant captive, you must be equipped as a soldier on that battlefield. How are you going to be equipped as a soldier on that battlefield so when you encounter an enemy combatant, you can take him captive? You do it by being equipped with the full armor of God by having your waist girded with the truth, by taking up the breastplate of righteousness, by having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, by putting on the helmet of salvation and taking up the shield of faith and using the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, to do combat with the enemy. How did Jesus defeat Satan in the wilderness? He used the word of God. Satan thrusted, Jesus parried. Satan came back with another swipe and Jesus blocked it with his sword and parried again and ultimately sent him packing, right? Why? Because he knew how to use that sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
And if we're going to be successful in combat against the enemy, we need to be strong, not in our own strength, but in the power of his might. We need to be equipped, not with our own resources, but with the full armor of God. Now, I don't want to leave you unarmed. I don't want you to go out from here thinking that that you're going to be engaging in the battle and that you're not prepared. Listen, I'm telling you that armor is yours. Now, we're going to spend a Sunday or two talking about that armor, but I don't want you to wait until then to put it on. (laughs) You need to take up that full armor of God right now, and you need to be prepared to engage the enemy. Well, one of the ways that you do that is by having the right mindset. And you what do you mean the right mindset? I mean having set your mind on the right things. I'm going to give you two or three scriptures as we finish that will that will help you with this. Turn with me to Romans chapter twelve. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. In other words, don't be pressed into the mold that this world wants to press you into, but rather be transformed. And really, that is be ye being transformed, right? By what? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So our minds need to be transformed and they need to be renewed and that happens by submitting ourselves to the will of God. To saying no longer what I want, but what God wants. So when Satan comes to you and he tries to pull upon that lust of the flesh, maybe even a natural desire by suggesting that you fulfill it in some way that is contrary to God's word, you can say, you know what? I may have that desire. That may even be a legitimate desire, but God has told me how I am to fulfill that desire and I am not going to exercise my own will. I'm going to submit myself to his will. And when Satan says, well, the rest of the world does it that way, you can say, you know what? I'm not going to be conformed to this world, but I'm going to conform myself unto God and unto his will. So in other words, you get it straight in your head who's in charge, right? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now I want you to turn to Colossians chapter three. I know I've got you doing Bible drills this morning, but it's just that kind of a message and I know you're grownups and you can handle it. Colossians chapter 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion and evil desires, and covetousness which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, 
to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ, this is how you do this, by the way, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen? We are to set our mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. In other words, our priorities are to be heavenly priorities. Because you see, all this is going to burn. All this is going to be dissolved. And so our hearts need to be at home in him. One more thing. Philippians, just a short turn to the left here. Chapter four. Chapter four, verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your, enemy, let your gentleness be known to all men. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. You see, that anxiety that we so often feel, that fear that sometimes manipulates our minds, man, I'll tell you what, there are very few hooks that the, that the enemy would rather get in you than the hook of anxiety. Because that anxiety can pull you in ways that almost nothing else can. And the Lord says here through Paul, be anxious for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and supplication. You see, I'm not, I'm not talking about just blind optimism that says, oh, don't worry, be happy. Well, you know what? If you're not, if you're just going to be happy, you, you know, it's like you're, you know, just checking out of reality. Look, sometimes there are things going on in life that being worried or anxious about is a natural, a natural response. But God has called us not to natural responses, He's called us to supernatural responses, hasn't he? He's told us not to operate in our own strength, but to operate in the power of his might. He's equipped us not with our own weapons of warfare, but with his weapons of warfare, the full armor of God and the sword of the spirit. And so he doesn't say, don't worry, be happy. He doesn't say, be anxious, just you know, relax. That's not what he says. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So he doesn't say, don't worry, be happy. He says, don't worry, pray. Listen, if you are a person who is always anxious, then let's change the descriptor and say that you are a person who is always in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Every time you feel that twinge of anxiety, let it drive you to your knees. Let it bring you before the throne of God. Let it bring you before the throne of grace. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And here's the result. And the peace of God. You remember? Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. In other words, sometimes the believer can have a peace in their heart that the rest of the world looks at and says, how in the world are you keeping it together right now? With everything that's going on in your life, how are you not a basket case at this point? Well, that is the peace of God that passeth understanding. They don't understand where your peace is coming from. You may not even fully understand how it is that God is manifesting this peace in your life. But when we choose to be anxious over nothing, but instead to respond by prayer to the Lord whenever those things come into our lives, it gives us the power to walk in God's peace even when we don't understand what it is he's going to do to solve our situation. Be anxious over nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Listen, friends. The battlefield upon which we fight with the enemy is the hearts and minds of the brethren. 
our hearts and minds. That's where the warfare is waged. That's where the enemy wants to attack. And if we will trust God, if we will, instead of responding with anxiety, respond to our anxiety with prayer, then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds. In other words, the devil won't be able to get a foothold in there. He won't be able to latch on. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, is the word of God true? Amen. Whatever things are noble, is the word of God noble? Amen. Whatever things are just, is the word of God just? Absolutely. Whatever things are pure, is the word of God pure? Unadulterated pure. Whatever things are lovely, is the word of God lovely? Absolutely. Whatever things are of good report, it is of good report. If there is anything praiseworthy, excuse me, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So certainly the word of God is one thing that falls into this category. It meets every single criteria. So we are to meditate upon the word of God. Now, meditation in the Bible is not some Eastern pantheistic meditation, right? It's not the emptying of your mind and focusing on your navel or some such thing. It's not repeating some mantra over and over and over again. No, the word meditating in Scripture is like a cow that chews its cud. And how does that work? He takes in some of the grass and he chews it and he swallows it. And then a little while later, it comes back up and he chews it some more and he swallows it again. And then a little while later, it comes back up and he chews it some more and he swallows it again. That's the kind of meditating that we're talking about. Don't get grossed out. It's a cow. It's just grass. It's no big deal. But you're chewing the word of God. You take in God's word and you chew it and you, you, you internalize it. And then a little bit later throughout your day, God brings it back to your mind. Have you ever noticed that? If you spend time in the morning with the Lord and you're in his word, that sometimes throughout the day, that word comes back to you again, right? So then when it comes back to you again, you meditate on it. You think about it. You talk to the Lord about it. And then you, you internalize it. And through this process, our hearts and our minds are protected and transformed. Now, are there other things that can fall into this category? Absolutely. How about your testimony? What God has done for you? All the blessings with which God has blessed you, all of these things poured out in your life. These are the things that we're to think on, the things that we're to meditate on. In other words, don't focus on the things that you don't have. Focus on being grateful for the things that you do. Don't, don't focus on the problems in your life, but focus on the one who is the solution to every problem in this life. Those things that are good and True, those things that are noble and just, those things that are pure and lovely, if anything's of good report or virtue, anything praiseworthy in them, meditate on these things. Listen, your mind can be set. So set it. Set your mind on things above, not things of the earth. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't allow anxiety to rule in your heart, but allow prayer to motivate you to seek God's face. Meditate on his word and think on those things and know that when you do this, you are taking up the full armor of God with which you will be able to stand against the wiles of God. The devil, And let me tell you, friends, you do not stand alone. You stand with the Holy Spirit and you stand with the Son of God. And we know that the Son of God not only can defeat the devil, but has already defeated the devil. That he is a defeated foe and that Jesus put away our iniquity once and for all in one day on Calvary's cross. Now we talked for a moment as we began, about the names by which Satan is referred to and that those names told us something about his character. But what about the character of the one whom we serve? And what about the names by which he is called? I'd like to end with this. As we look through the scripture, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to in a variety of ways, among which are the following. He is our advocate. He is almighty. 
He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Amen of God, the Anointed One, the Arm of the Lord, the Author and the Finisher of our faith. He is Beloved. He is the blessed and only potentate, the branch, the bread of life, the brightness of the Father's glory, the bridegroom, and the bright and morning star. He is the carpenter's son, the chief shepherd who has become the captain of our salvation. He is the chief cornerstone, the chiefest among 10,000, the chosen of God. He is Christ the King. He is the chosen of God, the Christ of God, the power of God and the wisdom of God, the heir of all things, the maker of the world, the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. And you know what else he is? He's our redeemer. He is the one who paid the price for my sin and for yours. And he is the one who, who stands beside us in the battle and will not leave us on the field. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is our God. Amen. He's the one who is equipping us. He is the one whose armor we stand and fight garbed in. He's the one who has shown us what it means to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And he will not leave us to fight our battles alone. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have equipped us for battle. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one who leads the charge against the enemy. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be part of your battalion, part of your cohort. Lord, you are our king, our God, our general. You are our savior. And we worship you this morning. Lord, equip each person here. Encourage them to take up the full armor of God and help us to stand against the enemy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.